be seated. Good morning. I am not Pastor Jared, and you are all glad that I am, especially the children are glad that I'm not Pastor Jared. I want to take a couple of moments. We've been trying to get this done, and with schedules, it has been uh, delayed, but I want to, um, as a privilege, bring to your attention today individuals who are a part of us, a part of faith, who are answering God's call and moving through the licensure process that is a part of our denomination in the, in the movement of uh, culminating in ordination. We have really a three-step uh, system. One who expresses a call to ministry in the local level is then interviewed for the first time on our district level, and if uh, all of that goes well, then they are granted a local license. We have an individual today we are going to be recognizing who uh, has received his local license but doesn't have the certificate as of yet and who will continue in that licensure status as he moves toward what is then next council license. And then the third step is ordination. So there are years in between, and there are classes to complete, and there are in, uh, moments of being interviewed that also must take place. But the denomination finally puts their stamp of approval on an individual saying, this is a trustworthy individual who is suitable for the ministry. I'm so thankful in the time that even we've been privileged, Sharma and I, to be privileged to be a part of faith, we've had several individuals who have been called into the ministry, who have concluded their licensing, have been ordained, and are serving in various capacities, and that is a joy to celebrate. So as that persists, as that continues, we thank God that faith is being used as a means of calling, sending, equipping, preparing individuals for the work of ministry. So I would like two individuals to come uh, before the congregation here. Aaron Johnston, who is uh, operating under a local preacher's license, and our own uh, Pastor Jared Massey, who has received his council license. I want to issue them their official certificates today. So Aaron, as you come forward... This indicates that you have a local preacher's license. When it was first given, this will be that which you operate under until you receive your council license. And you also have signatures here of three of our elders, signifying that we approve of you along with the district as one who is worth uh, receiving, worthy of receiving a local preacher's license. So congratulations, Aaron. And we're glad for you, brother. And Pastor Jared, this has been signed by all the children. No. Um, <laughs> this is a council license, which you have been waiting for. And this not only has my signature on it, but it has other signatures from our West Central District Board of Examination Ordination, indicating that you have been issued your council license, which is one step away from ordination. So we will have days in the future to celebrate both with Aaron and with Jared of their advancing in licensure. So today we give this to Jared. He's been operating under this already, but formally we give this to him today, his council license. God bless you, Jared. All right, you're up. Well, good morning. How are you all this morning? Sunny day, hot but sunny day, and for Buckeye fans, you have something to at least be somewhat okay with. I don't know if we're excited about it, but we got something that we didn't get last week. Well, we last left off with Moses in the burning bush being called by God to save God's people, the Israelites. That's where we last left off. And if you remember, Moses wasn't really wanting to do it. He came up with a lot of excuses, but finally he was like, God, I will do it. So now we go into 
the story with Moses and Aaron meeting with Pharaoh. This meeting doesn't go as well as Moses hoped for. If you have ever watched the Ten Commandments, to let my people go, that's what he wants. That's what God wants. But does Pharaoh give in? No. He doesn't want any part of it. So God starts his plan to work on Pharaoh. The ten plagues. Anyone heard of these plagues? Don't worry. We are going to go through each plague just to give you an idea of what was going on at this time. So the first one is the river turns into blood. If you're around that, that is not a natural thing to happen. You're probably wondering, oh man, what is happening? And this is where they get their water from. It's not like they had water fountains or anything like that. This was their source of water. So that's the first step. The next step turns in, and we have lots of frogs. Okay, you might be thinking, that's not as bad as a river of blood. But a lot of frogs, that's, that's a little bit of a situation, right? Not a natural thing to go on. Here's the thing. At this point, as the Pharaoh changed his mind, no. He's not going to let the Israelites go. But then we get this. Gnats. Now, have you ever experienced some gnats? They are quite annoying. But I want you to imagine just tons and tons of gnats. Not your typical one or two you're dealing with, maybe in your kitchen. Swarms of gnats. Okay, now we're starting to get even more serious, right? This is a situation that we won't, we probably wouldn't like. Pharaoh doesn't change his mind, though. So then comes the next one. We have boils. Oh, actually, this is flies. I'm sorry. Flies. Now, the thing with flies that's a little bit different than gnats is they bite. Has anyone been bitten by a fly before? It is not an enjoyable experience. Not at all. And then we go to dead livestock. So we've already dealt with the water source, and now we're dealing with a food source. Still, though, Pharaoh is not having it. And at this point, this is affecting everyone. I want, I want you to think about that. It's not just affecting Egyptians. The Israelites are living in this situation. Think of how bad this is. We might think our situations in life are bad. We're dealing with lots of plagues right now in this situation. They have it bad. But often that's when time is God is working through, through us and with us is during these bad circumstances. But we're not done yet. Then we have boils. I've never experienced a boil in my life, but I'm sure they are painful. Not something you would want on your whole body, right? Then we go to the next, and we have hell. Not just your typical, but this is damaging enough to kill people. And then we go to our next, locusts. Locusts. Now, we actually don't have locusts around here. Now, I always grew up, I am from southern Ohio, so keep that in mind. We call cicadas locusts. Uh, I know they're not the same thing. But just imagine the sound of cicadas during the times, the 17 years that they come, to a whole nother level. And what do the locusts do, though? They don't just make the sound, and they're not just scary big bugs, right? They eat all the crops. So all the water has been covered in blood, right? It's, in, it's blood now. It's not even water. And then we got the livestock, and now we have the crops. So the food source and the water source are completely gone. You think by now, Pharaoh's thinking, okay, obviously Moses has God on his side. He doesn't, though. So we go to the next. Complete darkness for how many days? Three. It's not just a couple hours or anything like that. Darkness for three days. That's still not enough for Pharaoh. We have the final plague the angel of death. But here's the thing. The angel of death was going to go to every firstborn son, kill firstborn son, right? God made a way for the Israelites, though, to cover their door in lamb's blood so they would be safe. Who was actually affected, though? Pharaoh. Finally, God got to Pharaoh through this. And what does he finally decide to do? 
he lets the Israelites go. The story is not done, though. We learn, just a little bit we'll learn next week, that the Pharaoh might change his mind. But here's the thing. The Israelites were dealing with this just as much as the Egyptians. We deal with troubles too, but guess who is there for our troubles? God. God is always there to help us through troubles. So when you feel like you're dealing with a situation, maybe it's not the ten plagues, right? I don't think we'd all want that on us. But when you're dealing with something that's troubling you or is trouble for you, remember to look up instead of looking at the trouble. Look to who can help you with that. Thanks. Well, good morning and welcome on another beautiful Sunday morning. A great day to be in church, to be inside out of the heat and humidity. If you are here for the first time with us, there is a visitor card that we would like for you to fill out and place in the offering boxes, which are located here, someplace else, out in the back of the sanctuary, so that we can uh, acknowledge your presence with us. I... I tend to agree with my son. The necktie is probably the least useful and most ridiculous piece of wardrobe <laughs> of this age. The next to announce, oh, I have a five-part sermon this morning. And these next two points go together. The Faith Early Learning Academy is having a Krispy Kreme donut sale through this Tuesday at 9 a.m. The last chance to order the Krispy Kreme donuts. <laughs> One dozen of glazed donuts is $10, and the pickup will be Friday, September 24th. Proceeds will benefit all the student activities that they are attempting to carry out there. And if you buy several dozen donuts, this Saturday at 8.30 a.m., we have a work day here at the church. There are many projects, jobs for every skill level. Come and join us. Help to maintain the beautiful grounds that we have here. Yay. Ohio Christian University Love Offering will be September 26th. Um, September is the month when the Triple CU churches show their love, support, and partnership with OCU. These gifts fund scholarships and provide a space where students can be taught from a Christian worldview men and women being prepared to be Christian leaders in the workplace, church, mission field. Mark your offering envelope if you decide to give. OCU love. Okay, that's four. Pay special attention. Starting October 1st, the church directory will be available online. To access the directory, you will need to create an account in Engage, the same website that is used for their, our online giving. The account will give you access to the directory and the option of online giving. Names, addresses, phone numbers, and email addresses will be displayed in the directory. If you do not want that info displayed on the online directory, contact the church office by email, phone, or even in person. And if you do sign up for the directory, it does not obligate you to do online giving. And that's the announcements. So if you would stand. Father, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for the opportunity to come to your house. Help us to prepare our hearts to worship you in the way you deserve. Bless Pastor Jonathan, give him the words that you would have us hear. Give us open hearts, open minds, that we'll be ready to receive what he has for us and what you have for us. We thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for your patience with us. Lord, I ask all of this and I pray in your name. Amen.
is our time that we will um, observe our offering time. Um, and so you can give in the boxes um, that we've designated. But if you'll just bow your heads and pray with me right now. God, thank you that we can come in your house and we can worship you. And thank you so much for your presence and for your call to holiness and calling us to love one another just as you love us. God, thank you that we feel your presence today. And I pray that you continue to fill our hearts um, and that your, your scripture today just speaks to us and helps us in this week as we prepare our hearts. So God, just continue to be with us. Thank you so much for all you do. Take our lives and let them be for you, God. And let us just continue in that worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to me. Thank you, choir. Isn't it good to hear them? Amen. You can say amen. That's all right. It's acceptable in this place. So just as a reminder, we appreciate the choir. We appreciate those who are offering their voices in aiding us and directing us in our worship. And I always appreciate their gift to us as we come to worship. And thank you, Pastor Mike, for leading them. We're looking today at James. James is obviously burdened with not only what Christians profess, but how Christians live. We should be as well. Not only what we profess, what we declare that we hold in deep regard and value, but also how we live. So let's look together at James beginning our reading in chapter 3 in verse 16, and we're going to read into chapter 4 through verse 10. Would you stand with me, please, as we read from God's Word? For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? You lust and do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your own pleasures. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the Scripture speaks to no purpose? He jealously desires the Spirit which He has made to dwell in us, but He gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord. He will exalt you. You may be seated. We're looking today at a focus, perhaps best stated as a diagnosis, that James does not shrink back from addressing, and it is the issue of sin. I know that we live in 2021. I know that we have now reached such a sophisticated state culturally and sociologically that sin has become a topic of infrequent reference. We've come a long way, baby. And so as a result, we just feel as if we've arrived and sin is passe, that has been eclipsed, and now it's basically um, a concept that its time has come and gone. Well, with God, that couldn't be further from the truth. The primary issue that still plagues every generation that comes into this world that defines us all without redemption is sin. I know it's a topic we don't like to talk about. It becomes, to some people, off-puttish. I know that in many cases, people are just 
uh, incensed that we would ever, ever declare that there can be such a state of activity or condition that is related in any way to a topic or a subject known as sin. But the fact is, everything about God is laser-focused on sin. And if we want to act as if sin is not a problem, sin's not an issue, then why in the world did Jesus come to atone for sin? If it isn't the primary issue, then we, frankly, um, have missed the mark completely. I want us to know also about the church. Contrary to popular opinion, we're not here just for fellowship. We're not here just to have potluck dinners. We're not here just to share a hot dog occasionally. We are here as a primary purpose to be a sounding forth, to be an ever constant, consistent reminder that there is a plague that affects every human being on the face of the earth, and it is the, it is the communicable disease, the spiritual disease of sin. And Jesus has an answer for it. Praise God. Before we get, to though, though, to the answer, before we get there, there are some things we need to consider. We need to revisit what sin is, what it does, how it affects us, why it ought to alarm us, why we should never give it shelter. Did you hear that? Why God doesn't have in, in, any intention for us to give it shelter. The opening part where we read today, where we broke into the reading in chapter 3, is a great reminder to us that without question, without question, look at your own life, consider areas of your life where there has been disorder and chaos. Just think for a moment. I trust that it is not present tense, but I will say this. You might be in a situation where apart from your own action, apart from your choices, apart from your intention or your motives, you might be dealing with disorder and chaos. But I want you to consider whether it's in your past or whether it's being imposed upon you by someone else, anywhere in life that we can look, at, at, look and find chaos or disorder, it has as its root cause sin. It has as its root cause sin. Sin is at the root of every good thing that God ever created becoming disordered. God is a God of order. Amen. Everything that He does, everything that He has ever touched, everything He has brought into existence without question was distinguished by order. That's why also Paul says to the church in Corinth that was full of disorder and full of contention, he says, let everything be done decently and in order. God's a God of order. God is a God of order. God doesn't initiate chaos. God is not a God of disruption and disorder. God does not bring the mess to our situation. God is not the author of that. But I do want us to pin the blame where it should be pinned. At the root cause of every form of tearing at the good things that God does, that God creates, the relationships that He gives us to bless us, everything betwixt and between that can ever be called good because God is indeed the author of every good and perfect gift. Everything comes down from the Father of lights. All good things. And this is the God who doesn't change. There's no shifting with Him. There's no variableness with Him. What God does and who He is, He is good and does good. He is good and He does good. Sin is a chaotic disruptor and distorter of everything that God calls good. Are you hearing this? So as we open up the reading, for where jealous, jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder 
and every evil thing. So, if we want to understand sin at its impact and sin at its level of effect on us, it is that source of disorder, chaos, corruption, tearing away at that which is good, which has been ordained and ordered by God. It is that constant source of disorder. But wisdom from God is first pure. Wisdom from God is first pure. Then peaceable. Did you get that? How are you getting along with your neighbors? How are you getting along with your spouse? How are you getting along with people? I'm serious, folks. I want you to look at your life today, and if there is a pinpointed issue of chaos and disruption and disorder, what is the source of that? And who is the source of that? Are you? You don't know my neighbor. Yeah, it's you. <laughs> Friends, James is serious about doing real, candid consideration and inventory of our lives. What do people go through in dealing with you? It's quiet. For just a second there you could have heard a pin drop. What kind of a presence are you? Are you a presence of peace, purity? Are you among those who make peace? Are you among those who bring peace to turbulence and peace to disruption and peace to a difficult circumstance? Are you the soft answer that turns away wrath or are you the stoker of the fire? Do you, for, do you, do you pour gas on the flame or are you a presence that can put it out so that it does not consume in a rage? I'm serious, folks. So was James. Testimonies are cheap without a life that verifies it. Talk is cheap. Talk is cheap. And James is alluding to that. Talk is cheap if there isn't a life to back it up. Amen. So, I want us to understand if there's any chaos, if there's any disorder, if there's any disruption, if there's any bone of contention in your life, there is at its source sin. So my prayer for us and my prayer for you in your sphere of influence is let God do good inventory of your life. Have the courage to be honest about what He exposes. And then do what we're about to get to here in just a moment. All right, so you're with me so far? We're talking about the chaos of sin. Second thing that I want us to note is the cause of sin. We find this in the first couple of verses of chapter 4. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Well, they did this, or they did that. Get off of my yard! Have you, ever, have you ever thought, have you really ever examined what people get all miffed about? It doesn't take much of significance. Have you ever noticed that? It just doesn't take much of significance. They let that dog into my yard. The day is coming for that dog. Friends, care about more important things. 
Get off of the nonsense. Quit being petty. Think about souls. Think about eternity, would you? Would you? Just once? Think about eternity. This life is like a vapor. James says that. This life is vapor-like. It's briefly here and gone. And what have you wasted your energy and your intensity on? The cause of sin is evil desires, uncurbed passions, so you commit murder. He's not talking about you actually go out and kill people, but by your words and by your indictments and by your slanderous gossip and by the hurtful, harmful things you say you murder, James calls it murder. James calls it murder. James calls it murder. This is on the heels of him saying, the tongue is a little thing, but it is boastful. It's a braggart, is really what the original tells us. You are envious and you cannot have. You can't obtain. You want something that you don't have and you think you ought to have it by any other means. After all, the ads on television tell you you deserve it. But you do not have because you do not ask. But the issue is the, the motive behind your asking is self-centered. It's selfish. That's the reason for your asking. So he uses terms that would shock the socks off of churchgoers. Do you get that? He's not talking to the world here. He's not talking to the ungodly. He is talking to individuals who are a part of the church. This is a general letter that James, as the head of the Jerusalem church, sends out. What's he saying? You adulteresses. That's a term that ought to bother us. Do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? In other words, you can't have your feet, one planted in one world, one planted in the other world. It's either or. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? Quit trying to live a spiritually schizophrenic life, a divided life. Or do you think that the Scripture speaks to no purpose? He jealously desires the Spirit which He has made to dwell in us. The cause of sin, frankly, the cause of sin, we might say, it's the devil. You know, I'm old enough, I'm old enough to go back to the Flip Wilson show. I know people will say, who, is that on TikTok? Um, I'm old enough to go back to the Flip Wilson show when he always said, the devil made me do it. Everybody laughed, everybody laughed. Listen, I've told you before, the devil could quit and go to Florida on vacation permanently. And we would carry on his deeds. Because of the way we are born, the way we are inclined, the selfishness that, that moves the fallen human condition without the redemption of the blood of Jesus Christ, we would carry on his work quite well. The cause of sin, then we could say, as James was getting around to it, the cause of sin is us. There is a sense in which if we're ever going to understand and appreciate the grace of God as being a gift, we must own our own sin. And how murderous and how terrible in the eyes of God it actually is. But He gives a greater grace. Chaos of sin, cause of sin. But I want to talk to you in closing about the cure for sin. Now you ought to perk up. The cure for sin. Yeah. 
I actually believe the book. Okay, just want to go on record today in case you wondered. I believe the book. And I believe that when Jesus was sent, it wasn't just for a handful that God chose. I don't believe that God handpicked individuals to be saved and the rest of us He doesn't care about. I don't believe that at all. I believe that He loves the world. I believe that He came to redeem all of us if we will. Amen. So he's not, he's not selecting a few, and He's not leaving all the rest of us to be eternally lost. He has sent Jesus as the singular cure for sin. Praise His name. So, we need to know sin brings nothing but chaos. We need to know the cause of sin. It's in us from the beginning when we come into this life and we're cute, and people Google and awe over us and all that stuff. We're the cause of it. It's in us. But God has a cure for sin. So what does He say? He gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So He makes a principal statement. The principal statement is this. Do you want grace? Humble yourself. All right, well, do we get that? If you want grace, if you want this grace, if you want the cure, humble yourself. Humble yourself. Why? He gives grace to the humble. Now, He holds at bay. He keeps at distance. He stiff arms the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. That's good news. If I'll humble myself, if I'll mourn and lament, uh, and lament over my condition, and if I mean it, and if I come before God, the giver of grace, He will give grace that deals with not only the actions of my sinful life, but the condition itself of my sinful life. Amen. He gives grace to the humble. So what are we supposed to do? Submit. People can keep God at bay. He's given us the freedom and the responsibility to choose. We can actually choose, I'm not going there. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to submit. Well, then I just want to tell you, bless your heart, with all the love I can express to you, you'll never get the grace. Did you hear me? If you will not, if you will not submit, you will not get the grace. Sub, if you will not come under, if you will not come down even from your inflated view of yourself, you will never get the grace. The giver is not making it difficult. The giver simply knows the principles that must be fulfilled in order for us to get His grace. So, submit to God. Then what? If we submit to God, if we give God, in essence, the green light, we need to absolutely dis distinctively give the devil the red light. Resist the devil, he will flee from you. He doesn't want to give up turf, and he doesn't want to lose you or me to God. But you know what? God can give us the, the strength and the favor of his grace sufficient enough for you to stand up and say no. Yes to God, no to the devil. Isn't that a wonderful reality? Praise God. Amen. Thanks be unto God. We're not going home yet. Submit, resist, draw near, come close, come close. God gives us a great promise here. If you come close to me, I'll come close to you. There can't help be a meeting if we come close to him. But then he says something that I want us to get before we leave here today. Get this in your hearts. Get this in your minds. Cleanse your hands. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. 
Note what James is saying. He is not saying, pray this prayer. God, just somehow remove from me any interest in sin and we'll be good. No. He says, cleanse your hands, you sinners. This is a shock statement. This is a wake-up moment for folks who attend church and come for worship settings that James says, cleanse your hands, you sinners. Boy, church folks don't want to be called sinners. It's not just the world that wouldn't want to be called a sinner. Cleanse your hands. Stop the sin business. Do you get that? My dad, not having the same deft touch as my mother, would simply say to us at times, or maybe me singularly, Jonathan, knock it off. I got, the, I got the gist of what he was after. He was not saying, steadily over time, just slowly, by degrees, stop. No, he meant, knock it off. God in His grace is telling us to knock it off. Do not cozy up to the practice of sin. Cleanse your hands, sinners. Second thing he says is remarkable. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. All throughout the Old Testament into the New is consistent. David prays for a united heart. James is clearly, as a Jewish mind, is, is, is in essence saying the same thing. Purify your heart, double-minded. The word is dipsikos, double-souled, double psyche. God will not inhabit the life of one who still has an attitude in, in their heart that is opposed to doing the will of God. God will not live where there is an ongoing competition for lordship. Do you hear me? He will be Lord of all, or He will not be Lord at all. So James is simply making that clear, very clear. Now, is he saying we really can purify our hearts? No, he's simply saying both in cleanse your hands and in purify your hearts. He's saying this, you do your part. You do your part. You can't do what God alone can do. I can't ultimately sanctify my heart and fill my heart with God's Spirit. But God will if I meet the requirements necessary for Him to do what He aims to do. Do we understand that? Amen. This is a greater grace, greater than sin. It is a mega grace. So therefore, cleanse your hands, you sinners, purify you, your hearts, you double-minded. And then here is the attitude with which the cure is made available for the individual. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and He will exalt you. Our problem is we exalt ourselves, isn't it? That's the problem of the human condition. Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Our problem is we exalt ourselves. So our responsibility is lower ourselves, submit, mourn, weep, let Him exalt you. And what He does is He exalts you in grace. What God does wipes away the guilt and the track record of our wrongs. And what God also does is He, using the blood of Jesus, cleanses the heart from all sin. 
and makes us fit for the dwelling of the Holy Spirit. That is His exaltation of you and me. Don't get the idea, well, if I'll do this, He'll really make, my name will matter. No, He wants to exalt you in grace. Do we get that? So that you're a testimony of grace wherever you go. He wants to raise us up in and by and through grace. Praise His name. Sin is nothing but chaos. Sin has a cause. But thank God, sin has a cure. Have you, have you cooperated with the cure? Father, in the name of Jesus, may the help of Your Spirit coming to each one of our hearts speak to us regarding this truth. We can be a part of this congregation. We can sing the songs. We can even pay our tithes. We can be generous givers. We can work here on work day. We can do all kinds of things. But you're the one that knows the heart. I pray that you'll be able to just have access into our hearts today. Is there sin in us? Is there in us a source of disorder and disruption and chaos? Is that in us? Help us not stop until we embrace the cure in Jesus Christ. We pray it in His name. Amen. Let's stand together. We will sing. If you want to pray, we invite you to pray. If you're at home watching by live stream and you need to pray, pray. Ask the Lord to help you mean this very Scripture and move through it in an obedient way. But take God at His cure.
You may be seated, and if you would remain just for a couple of minutes, we are going to conclude our service with um, anointing Donna Fisher on behalf of a cousin, um, who Linda, who has been dealing with COVID for over six weeks and is in the hospital. And as many um, have been so affected in their lungs, is, uh, is struggling. So uh, is Donna able to come forward? Donna, if you would come forward. And while Donna, you're coming and others, we would encourage others to gather around her as she is anointed in the stead of this cousin, Linda. But I also want to mention that we are praying for the family of Bob Morgan. We love Bob and Nellie. They've been away from us in Mount Vernon after they moved for quite some time, but we love Bob and Nellie. They are dear to us. Bob passed away Wednesday, and tomorrow from 4 to 8, from 4 to 8 in Bremen at Morgan Funeral Home, there will be calling hours for Bob. We would encourage you to show your support for Nellie and those who are grieving in that family. So Bob, Morgan, um, we love them dearly. The funeral will follow privately back in um, up north. So we just want to remember them. We just got word before I came out today, I had been visiting um, Ken Smith over in Crestview, and his wife Kathleen has been in Crestview. And both of them had been recently moved there. Kathleen had had COVID. Kathleen was cleared and put in the wing just across the hall from Ken. Ken suddenly, unexpectedly passed away this morning, and family members were gathering, and I believe Pastor Aaron went over to have prayer with them. So we're praying also for the family of Ken Smith, also the other names that are mentioned today. So we have a lot of folks to remember, don't we? And we have a lot of folks dealing with COVID, many who are quarantined. So just be mindful. Pray for those who are in need, will you? And at this point, we will be glad to anoint Donna on behalf of her cousin. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Father, with gladness and confidence, we call upon you as our Father. We have confidence today that we're not opening up a new avenue to you. Jesus has already made the way open. Jesus then bids us to come. So we enter into the presence of our Father, for we find help and grace in time of need. You are the God of help. You are the God who brings healing. You are the God who knows what we're made of, for you have made us and not we ourselves. Our members are written in a book. You know that we are also made from dust. You know our frailty, and you know our weaknesses. You know the weakness of the body in general, and you know that we can encounter an illness like what we've been dealing with that can threaten our very lives. So, Father, today we pray that you would work in Linda's life. We pray, Lord, for a breakthrough moment of your health-giving power. We ask you, O oh God, to raise her up. And we have many others today that are on our hearts who are affected by COVID. Raise them up, we pray, O oh God. Break through into their lives, we pray, and bring about a miraculous answer that perplexes all around them but bring pra brings praises to your name. So, Father, we ask today, work, we pray, have your way. Hold folks in good stead, we pray. And Lord, we think today of those who need comfort because of a very real fresh loss. Oh God, how hopeful we are that you are the God of all comfort. So whatever we need and how unique that pain might be to us as individuals, you are the God of all comfort. So comfort and help, we pray, and encourage the heart that is grieving today. We ask all of it, we ask all of this today in the wonderful and matchless name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. 
Amen and amen. God bless you, Donna. Well, folks, it's been good to be in the house of the Lord. I trust that we will take to heart the truth God's given us today, straight from His Word, and may He go with you. May His grace be found for you sufficient, and may you be light and salt as you go out into this world. We love you. We're praying for you. God bless you. You're dismissed. <laughs>